With that, um, I would like to call to order the September meeting of the SWLRT DBE Disadvantaged Business Enterprise and Workforce Advisory Committee. And um, <clears throat> welcome all the members, alternates, and those uh, pu uh, in the public that are listening in to our meeting this afternoon. COVID-19 has caused us to alter our meeting procedures and the Metropolitan Council Chair has determined that it is not practical or prudent to conduct in-person meetings due to the pandemic. The Metropolitan Council and its committees and advisory committees will conduct meetings in accordance with Minnesota statute section 13D.021 and members will participate by telephone or other electronic means. Given that it is not feasible for the public to attend these meetings in person, this meeting remotely via our website and YouTube. The public may also submit comments to public.info at metc.state.mn.us and we will respond promptly. Just a few uh, housekeeping um, reminders as well for this virtual meeting. Please mute yourself if you are not speaking. If you are having technical issues, let us know in the chat and we'll try to resolve them. Please close other teleconference applications as we've learned that it improves the meeting audio and visual quality. The meeting is being recorded by the Metropolitan Council. Meeting handouts and presentation are posted on the project, project website, swlrt.org. With that, I will turn it over to my co-chair, Salima, to conduct the roll call. Thank you, Ashante. At this time, we will commence with the roll call. I have already identified many of us who are here, so I'm just gonna go through who I see already. Barry, welcome. Gilbert, Marvin, Sheila, Julie. Wondering if anybody's here from Twin Cities Rise, Alex. Anybody here from Summit Academy? I see you, Mel. Anybody here from City of Minneapolis? I see you, John, John O'Fallon, Mary Schmidt, Barb and Kendra are both here. Um, from Lunda, anybody here? Dale, Krista? Katie, I know you're here from CS McCrossan. I see Mike Tony from APJV. Elaine, Salima, and Brianne here from MDHR. Uh, I see Ashante, a co-chair, Sam, John, Eli, Anyone else from Met Council? I'm, I'm here too, Selena. I heard of, oh, welcome, Mahad. Um, and then we see Monica from uh, Ellis Black. Anyone else here from Ellis Black? Okay. Anyone here from the project office? Good afternoon, Salima. This is Nick Dial. Hello, Nick. Welcome. Uh, also, I just just coming off a call with Dale. Even he might be just a little bit late. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else we have missed? Yeah, I'm getting through. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I I think we have everybody. Uh, Ashantia. Uh, um, at, at this point, we will uh, move over to, um, oh, thank you, uh, Elaine, for letting me know Leslie's here. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, everyone. Hi. Next, we're going to move over to our meeting minutes that have been provided, and they are in the handouts. If you have any edits to the meeting minutes, you could let us know by email or uh, uh, in uh, getting a hold of the co-chair so that we can make the corrections. Um, and at this time, uh, if if there are no immediate corrections known, um, I will uh, turn over to Barry, who is going to be presenting for Building Strong Communities today.
Thanks, Salima. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's a slide. The next slide. that shows our placements and apprenticeship placements. Um, 12 of the 15 placements have been in the metro area. Uh, one, um, Nicole Bolden was sworn in at the operator engineers union meeting last night as a apprentice. So that was kind of nice to see. Um, <clears throat> continue to work with the uh, Duluth participants who are still seeking work. Um, any questions? I found out like 10 minutes ago that I was presenting, so bear with me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, so another big thing is um, on the next slide, the state building trades passed a resolution to take the building strong communities under the wing of the statewide building trades instead of it has been housed at Minneapolis building trades. Uh, we had such a good success with the Duluth program that we're going to, uh, we have a meeting with the city of Rochester to bring it to Rochester as well in 2022. So there'd be a cohort in the Metro, one in Duluth and one in Rochester. Um, so there's a bit of a bit of flux to figure out how we're gonna do all that for 2022. We're already getting into the time where we started to recruit, you know, by the mid to end of October, we need to be recruiting for next year's group. So uh, there's a lot that's gonna have to happen in the next month, month and a half. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. And I guess I'll answer any questions if anyone has them. All right, well, thank you. That was easy. <laughs> thank you so much, Barry. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to, um, um, Ashanti. Thank you, Salima. Um, next on the agenda, we have Sam O'Connell uh, to provide the Southwest uh, Library uh, Project update. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Sam. Thanks for uh, having me provide a, just a really quick update. I know we have a pretty extensive agenda. Um, but just wanted to highlight one um, particular event that did happen um, for Southwest LRT. On August 24th, Senator Tina Smith um, was in town as part of her role on the U.S. Senate um, Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. She chairs the subcommittee on Housing, Transportation, and Community Development. And um, Senator Smith held a hearing in Minnesota in the Twin Cities to talk about transit and uh, Metro Transit actually hosted her um, her event where folks from the community and also some of our policymakers provided an opportunity to talk about how important transit is to our region and what are some um, some creative ideas that we have going on. So I just wanted to share a couple of photos from that, in that uh, event. With her was also Federal Transit Administrator Nuria Fernandez, um, who came in for the event, as well as um, the Regional uh, Administrator for Region 5 that um, our Minnesota sits in within the Federal Transit Administration, uh, Kelly Brookins. And Kelly is actually the individual that has the mask in the uh, foreground. So um, it was a great opportunity to share what we're doing on Southwest LRT. And Jason, if we can move to slide eight, I'll just a couple more pictures here. So part of the um, tour that was given to the administrator and to Senator Smith was a Southwest LRT. And um, we just wanna thank Dale and his team for making that happen. And this is uh, the Royalston station area where we were able to show some of the construction progress that's being made. And then again, just how important Southwest LRT is to the regional uh, system in terms of transit. And the next picture, just another, or sorry, Jason, next slide, please. Um, just shows an opportunity for um, uh, the Senator and the FTA administrator to meet with some of our great workers that are on the project. So again, thanks Dale for having our um, folks available to talk about the work that they do. Um, which was asked about by both the Senator and the Administrator. And then I just wanna highlight as well, 
the two gentlemen that are in the lower left hand corner were our operators, our bus operators for the day who uh, not only transported the senator and um, the administrator, but also staff uh, to Southwest here at the Royalston, but then um, also took them to the Orange Line to see the Lake Street Station uh, that will be opening a little later this year. But um, fun fact, uh, that is father and son that joined us that day. So our two drivers were also father and son with us. Um, so that's uh, just a quick project update on, this is quite the milestone. We felt very honored to host uh, the, the Senator as well as the administrator and really show them the good work that's happening on Southwest. So um, I will kick this back to Ashanti or uh, Salima, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Sam? All right. All right. Next, uh, we have John Tao to provide the DB Achievement Report. Hey, everybody. So slide number 11 here, and this is the construction contract as of July 31st. Um, as you can see, all of the contracts are continuing to exceed their goals currently based on what's been built to date. And um, yeah, we'll have to monitor uh, the contracts as they go, but you know, the Franklin contract is coming to a close. So um, that's the one ch change that is coming here within the next few months. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here you can see the civil participation has been at 20% since uh, last year, January 2020. And then, uh, you know, in a good faith efforts meeting with Dale today, he shared that their commitments uh, and whatnot, or is that if everything continues as what's been uh, contracted out or on paper, then um, the participation towards the end of the project will be closer to 16%. So just this is just based on what's been billed to date. Next slide, please. And the systems contract uh, had a slight dip, but um, I, I think we are still waiting for their participation to uh, continue on with uh, the um, various construction sites and stations being turned over to them for their uh, work. So we'll hear later from them about uh, the upcoming work in the next couple of months here. Next slide. And then the Franklin contract, here it is. Uh, you, know, you can, can kind of see a slight dip here, um, but all the contracts and the commitment that uh, the Franklin contractor has uh, committed to the council is 18.6. So we, um, believe that they will make it just based on uh, what has been committed to and agreed upon since bid time is the 18.66. So uh, based on the contracts that we have and in talking with uh, the prime contractor, they will be uh, achieving that or pa surpassing that by a little bit. So um, yeah, we're going to watch that one pretty closely towards the end here. So next slide, please. And then uh, here are the disaggregated contracts for all of the construction contracts um, broken down uh, into the various ethnicities and gender. Um, there were a couple of new DBEs that were added. And this is a part of the change orders that had occurred within the last couple of months here. And it's been finally approved and then the prime contractors uploaded it into the uh, DBE system. So we are tracking that and um, adding that to the data here. Next slide, please. And um, something I am very happy to share is that, you know, of those change orders and additions, uh, the majority of it went to Minnesota firms. So there is a slight increase there for the Minnesota participation. Next slide. And then um, there was a uh, 
request from Ellis Black. Uh, they requested to remove HydroVac from their DBE commitments uh, from time of bid. Um, the issue was that HydroVac was a second tier subcontractor and had bid under a different contractor. So they was included in the bid. Uh, unfortunately, Ellis Black did not go with the contractor that they worked with. And then um, during the uh, uh, meetings that happened afterwards with Ellis Black, you know, OEO met with Ellis Black and confirmed that HydroVac was a DBE that they are committed to. And uh, I think that there was some confusion because of the similar names to the other um, HydroVac type of firm that is doing um, hydro excavation. So they assumed that that was the um, same business. So in previous DBE progress reports, you may have seen the HydroVac HydroVac had billed, and that was an error on Ellis Black's part. So we got a little bit more clarity of that uh, in the past couple of months here and clarified it. Unfortunately, due to the time that had lapsed and the work had been um, completed by a non-DBE firm, there was no opportunity to include HydroVac. So at that time, we um, spoke with Ellis Black and documented the reasons why and uh, Ella Black was transparent about what occurred and they committed to doing good faith efforts so as a part of that what they were able to do is include HydroVac in some uh, work that had occurred just this month so they were out there this past week and we were able to get out there and meet up with HydroVac and um, you know document their participation on site uh, the good faith efforts is going to continue to move forward. If there is any more work for HydroVac to participate, Ellis Black is going to uh, commit to working with them to find opportunities. But uh, it's just something that you know we want to stay on top of. And I believe that we met with them and confirmed with them at the pre-con. Uh, OEO also reached out to HydroVac at the pre-con meeting and uh, somebody from their team had expressed that they were going to be attending or go was going to have one of their staff attend. So we assumed that that was the case. Unfortunately, this was something that just kind of got lost in the shuffle of things. So that is the last slide for the DBE portion of this. And now we'll turn it over to Ashanti. Thanks, John. Uh, are there any questions for John relative to the DB achievement reporting? Uh, looks like something's in the chat. Okay. All right. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, LMJB uh, to report on their DB activities on the project. Krista Siebert. Is Dale here is instead? She's unable to attend today. She oh. had a uh, personal appointment she had to attend to. So I will pick up here for this. <clears throat> uh, for the most part on the Southwest light rail uh, DBE participation, there's no major changes month over month. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Some of the additions here, we've got Restoration Concrete Services is uh, performing work, and they just started that work here recently down in the Eden Prairie Town Center area. And then Dion Construction is going to be coming on board here shortly to start some of the plantings and landscaping items in segments two, three, and nine. But other than that, the uh, DBEs that are on site mostly have been and will continue to be. Next slide. This uh, month's highlight is safety signs. There are traffic control and signage provider. They're a DBE uh, contractor out of Lakeville, Minnesota. At a base contract value with us of $6.4 million. 
contract changes to date amount to 1.9 million, so a new contract value of about $8.3 million to date. And uh, as you can see, there's a quote from myself, but safety science ha really has been an integral part of the success of this project. Uh, their staff are very service oriented, whether it's our issue or something for the council, they get after it, they get it done, they're a good project partner. Next slide. Uh, owner changes to date is uh, 151 million. The DBE change orders as part of that $151 million of change is uh, about 14 million, so just under 10% in participation in the change orders for DBEs. Next slide. I'll hand the mic over to the next participant. All right. Sorry, go ahead. All right, thanks, Dale. This is, uh, hello everyone. This is Chris Gannon uh, from APJV. I'm the project manager for the systems project. Um, so not a whole lot of new info here, uh, just kind of a continuation from the last, last month. Um, so we have Gunner is doing the COM uh, communications junction boxes at a couple stations, West 21st Street and Southwest Station. And also uh, in August and continuing into September, October, hopefully into November, where we got started on the traction power uh, foundations for the substations. We sh we're starting at 303 uh, this week. And then after we're done with that, we'll move on to 307. That's going to involve uh, Dione, Bald Eagle, Moltron, Meyer doing trucking, and then IMO uh, with the pre section Slide, please. So for our change orders through early August, we're just over 9 uh, million change orders. The big one for us was the storage change order for material storage that Gunner is part of. Uh, it's part of the 1.4 for there um, that we have change orders to Gunner. And also Generation Cable is a big participant in change orders. Uh, overall, we're just under 18% and uh, the job to date participation that John had mentioned earlier. I think that's it for us. Next slide, please. Yep, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, we'll hand it off to Ellis Black. Wait, this is Brian with Ellis Black, and sorry for missing that first portion, John. Thanks for picking up some of the stuff on uh, Hydrovac. If anybody had any questions on that, feel free to shout them out, and I can do my best to answer. Uh, otherwise, I can give you a quick update here. Our update on change orders through end of July was that 39.3 number you can see there. Uh, and our commitment from our DB team was at 7.3, so tracking right at that 19%. And our bill through the end of July was 35.9. Uh, and our DB team was still at 6.8, so it's tracking right on at that 19%. Yeah, I don't know if there's any questions there, otherwise, that's our last slide. We have our team. Go ahead, next slide, please. Yep. All right. Ongoing team activity. We've still got a pretty good, pretty good crew of Gulf Fetch and Nakasone. We're we're kind of nearing the end of this thing, so we're getting into finishes, but getting everything started up, commissioned from our mechanical side, and then Nakasone's got a good crew here. Uh, always stone and tile. We've got a couple of bathrooms coming up here in our in our new kind of new remodeled area, so they'll be out here. Amtec supply only. There's just a bunch of small miscellaneous things we've been getting from them as far as miss metals or small changes here and there. Uh, and then with soda, we've got, once these locker room areas are ready, we'll have them out to install new lockers for the dressing room. And lastly, our D16 is out kind of sporadic. Kind of small business administration disaster assistance customer. 
main theme of PB geared toward the finish line the next uh, five, six weeks. Next slide at all, otherwise any questions for Franklin. Thank you, Brian. We'll now move over to the workforce participation report, Elaine. Hi, everyone. For the civil contract um, for the month of July, they worked 86,847 hours. Um, from the start of the project through the end of July, they have uh, worked 1,439,587 hours. In July, they came in at 9.52% for women, and overall they're at 8.29%. For people of color and indigenous people, they came in at 24.86%, and they're at 22.3% uh, percent overall. 1.14% of the hours in July were unspecified, and they have 0.52% since the start of the project that are unspecified. Excuse me. Next slide, please. So the breakdown came in at unspecified 1.14%, as I said. For white women, it was 5,000. 729 hours or 6.6 percent women of color came in at 2540 hours 2.9 percent men of color came in at 19,054 hours or 22 percent and white men were 58,530 hours 67.4 percent next slide please so cumulatively, um, they've worked, women have worked 119,299 hours. That comes in at 8.29%. And as I said, they were, for the month of July, came in at 9.52%. So there is steady increase in their participation. Next slide, please. For people of color, um, they've logged 321,063 hours, and they're at 22.3% overall. As I said, they're at 24.86% in July, almost 25%, which is really good. Next slide, please. On the trucking that's being counted, MBE has worked 23,852 hours. ZTS has worked 4,164 hours. Rock on Trucks has worked 709 hours. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Brianne Lucio. Hi, thanks, Elaine. <laughs> So uh, this month we're going to be highlighting the disaggregated data percentages for um, July as well as project to date for the civil workforce uh, participation. Um, for the month of July, uh, we do have Hispanic Latino at 12%, Native American, uh, employees who identified as Native American at 3%. Uh, multicultural is those persons who have identified as one or more, excuse me, one or more cultures. Um, that's coming in at 2%. Not specified is folks who chose not to identify um, at 1%. Black uh, at 6%, Asian at 2%, and white at 74%. And uh, again, project to date, we do have uh, just a little bit of change. Uh, Asian is coming at overall 3%, black at 6%, non-specified is holding steady at 1%, multicultural has dropped to 1% uh, project to date in comparison to July's numbers, Native American at 2% and Hispanic Latino at 10% and white at 77%. So you can see that for the month of July that there was a little bit of uh, increase in participation for uh, the BIPOC community. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just the same information, but it does designate out here 
um, women of color versus uh, men of color and the total percentage overall for each uh, identified racial group or ethnic group. Uh, project total hours again are 1,439,587 hours. Of that, the total POCI was 321,063 hours, coming in at 22.30%. And then for total women, the hours was 119,299, coming in at 8.29%. Uh, for the Asian American community, just um, the total hours was 122. Total hours for men was 44,666. So you can see of the overall total percentage points uh, for the Asian American community, uh, it was 3.11% uh, with predominantly male participation. Uh, Black Americans were coming in. For the women percentage points, it was 1.19%. Male participation percentage was 4.64%. Total percentage of 5.83%. Um, again, you can see that uh, it was mostly male participation there as well. Um, for Hispanic Americans, it's 2.29% for women participation, 9.51% um, for male participation, for a total of 9.80%. Again, uh, male participation was very high in the Hispanic Americans uh, group. Native Americans, 0.79%, 1.33% uh, for male participation, so an overall percentage of 2.12%. Multiracial, we do have 0.05% for women's participation as well as 1.39% for male participation, coming in at 1.44% overall. White Americans is 5.94%, men participation 71.22%, for a total of 77.16%. And then again, not specified uh, is 0.01%, male participation of 0.51%, coming in at 0.52%. Um, so this is just another way to look at that pie chart, and you can see how it's broken down between um, men and women participation for each of those groups. Next slide, please. So I will pass this back to my colleague Elaine Valadez to go over the system's workforce participation percentages. Thank you. Thank you, Brianne. Uh, for the systems contract uh, for July, they worked 248 hours. Since the start of their work, they've only worked 635 hours. Um, in the month of July, they came in at 13.71% for women, and they're at 17.48% overall. For POCI, they came in at 26.61% for July, and they're at 27.56% overall. They have zero unspecified hours. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, the Franklin contract, thank you. Uh, in July, they logged in 5,097 hours and they've worked 83,901 hour since the start of their work. Uh, they came in at 14.05% for the month of July for women. Uh, the overall, they're at 8.21%. For POCI, they came in at 17.95% for the month of July, and they're at 23.79% overall. Um, in July, they reported 4.39% of unspecified hours, and they're at 5.24% overall. Next slide, please. And here is the breakdown on the different uh, constituency groups. Unspecified, it was 224 hours, um, or 4.39% in July. Uh, white women came in at 466 hours, 9.14%. Women of color came in at 250 hours, or 4.9%. Men of color came in at 1,098 hours, or 21.54%. And white men, 
came in at 3,060 hours or 60.02%. And next slide, please. So since the start of the project, um, women have worked 6,890 hours. Uh, the cumulative percentage since the start of the project is 8.21%. And in July, they, like I said, they came in at 14.05%. Next slide, please. And for POCI, they've worked 19,961 hours since the start of the project. They're at 23.39%. They came in at 26.45% in the month of July. And I believe that's all I have. Um, I will turn it over to LMJV. Thank you. Unless someone has questions, I'm sorry, I should have asked. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, Dale, are you reporting for LMJV's workforce activities? Yes. Okay, so for workforce activities, August of 2021, uh, Krista con continues her efforts with uh, our monthly SWLRT meetings, subcontractors, and internal with our own team here. She has a continual update meetings with LMJV reps here on site, field operations, and uh, upcoming hiring needs. Uh, also meeting with uh, the different entities on the project, LMJV, the systems and maintenance facilities contracts, workforce teams, reach out to project outreach events. Also meeting with Met Council and the MDHR on their second site visit last month. And then uh, her ongoing work with Dunwoody regarding outreach events, timelines, and event goals. Next slide. Also, outreach planning, meeting with the civil systems and facil facilities partners, uh, reviewing the LMJV workforce hiring, continuation of workforce education meetings with SWLRT, the unions, educational institutions, and creating an overall picture of outreach activities for the next two years. Uh, monthly review of the meetings with representatives of the Building Strong Communities, how can they continue to be proactively active? And how do we get our subs more involved? Talking points, stuff they're working on there. Uh, potential Southwest light rail booth exhibit that the upcoming Construct Tomorrow event. Um, and that's at the end of the month here. And that's really an educational and outreach event to high school aged people, try and get people informed about the careers and the trades. Next slide, that might be it. Oh, yep, hires for August. New hires five, transfers 26. Uh, of the total people that came to the project for us, we had uh, 22 white males against the uh, seven POCI males. So that's about a 20, Three percent, and if you include the uh, female P POCI, you've got uh, pushing the 33 percent participation rate for this month, and the female participation total is uh, only two, which is a little bit low, but tracking with history on the project. Next slide. No, we oh, go ahead. Sorry, this is Katie. We did have a new hire uh, female, white female, that I'm not sure if it got counted on transfers or if it wasn't included. So we'll make sure that gets updated. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Dale, this is Elaine. Yes. Um, I believe that Krista said that one of the foremen that or the four persons is a female. And that could be. I don't have that data. The oh, one I, of the new uh, hires. I think it is. It's uh, yeah. uh, Jen 
trying to think of her last name. She's on the grading side. She's a foreman on the grading side. Uh, her last name escapes me, but her first name is Jen. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Dale. Any questions for LMJV on their workforce activities? Okay, thank you, uh, Dale. We'll ask APJV to present their workforce activities. All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is Mike Tony with the APJV. And, um, you know, so again, limited scopes for, for 2021. Um, we've been granted access to a uh, traction power substation beginning uh, this week. Um, they had three people out there yesterday when I talked to Jason, uh, the project manager. So. We actually, and some communication with Gunner with the boxes and, and a little bit of work with Premier. Um, so that's what's going on. So it's just, um, I think we had 248 hours during the month of uh, July. I think we have 242 in the month of August. So hopefully some hours will start kicking up. Um, again, we're at 635 hours for the project to date through the month of July. So uh, not a lot, and we don't expect a lot again in, in 2021. So this will be piecemeal as we go through the remainder of 21. Hopefully the spring of 2022, we'll get more access and really get going. Um, back in August, uh, I think the day our, we had mock interviews and um, we're meeting now, I have a one day training um, with uh, a mock interview, uh, not uh, mock interviews, but we have um, our utility trailer that, that trains our field employees for splicing, uh, transformers, and, and things that travel the country. We're having an event at uh, Summit Academy with their cohort, and we're going to do some IIF training. IIF is incident and accident, incident and act injury free environment. We don't want anybody getting hurt, let alone killed. Um, and we'll just treat, you know, how that works, and we'll be training that to the, to the bringing that information to the cohort along with the trailer. So there'll be two three hour classes, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and we'll rotate them. And um, we'll have our reps from local 160 and 292 to observe. And along with, we'll invite our lower tier subs to to get to know Summit Academy. So that'll be a good event at Summit Academy all day. And we're looking forward to that. So that's what we're doing right now. Any questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, we'll ask uh, Ellis Black to report. Yeah, this is Brian again, Ellis Black. You can go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so here's an update on some of our workforce activities here. Uh, our good faith meetings with NBHR, we actually had just earlier this week. Uh, try to be pretty candid, open, transparent about what we've got going on, where we can improve, you know, where some of the Areas of improvement could be, and then how our outlook is toward the end. So those are those are constructive and good meetings to have every week or every month, excuse me. Uh, these outreach opportunities with the other CBOs—that's something that Krista and the Lunda team has been you know, shouldering a lot of the weight for. But appreciate that. Where APJV and and the Alice Black team were uh, happy to join those and have our sub teams participate as much as possible. Uh, Bullets two and or sorry three and four are pretty similar there. Just reminder emails to our teams. Uh, kind of what we've been not on here, but what we've been tracking recently is we've got roughly six to eight weeks here till substantial completion on the project. So what we're trying to do is really, really reach out and hammer into our key subs that have the most amount of work in those weeks and, and see what we can do to try to increase participation here for these last, like I said, six eight weeks to the finish line. So. That's been the kind of the main focus here uh, to get to get to the end here and, and help out as much as we can. And that's that's pretty much bullet number four there, improvement opportunities. Um, and then this this is kind of an old note that we had the opportunity to have the MDHR team out on site about a month ago today um, for some face-to-face, in-person interviews with our team, our team members, and just kind of see what their thoughts are on opportunities, how they're being treated. Uh, Kind of in general, I know we didn't get a lot of the answers, but hopefully our team gave some pretty candid responses and everybody can learn from that and how we can improve in the future. So I think that was our last slide, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to jump in. Okay, 
Okay. Thank, thank you so you. much, Brian. We appreciate it. Are there any questions in general on the uh, workforce activities? Otherwise, we will be moving on to our next. Salima, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I, I, I wanted to welcome Tim O'Neill, who's here from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. He's a regional analyst for the seven county Twin Cities region and has been with DEED for nine years. And he's also a labor market expert for industry trends, workforce availability, hiring demand and overall job market. And we have invited him to share information about the construction industry, the data that they know, and we're and we're especially interested now that we're transitioning um, out of um, how COVID has affected it or not affected it. Um, so thank you, uh, Tim, so much for joining us. And uh, uh, please go ahead and get started. Thanks, Salima. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me all right. Um, as the introductions on, uh, yeah, Tim O'Neill from the, the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, I cover the seven county metro area, so uh, Anoka, Carver, Dakota, Hennepin, Ramsey, Scott, and Washington counties. Uh, if you need any sort of labor market information, reach out to me. Um, I've got my contact information uh, in these slides, and then you can find all of our labor market information online at mn.gov slash deed. Um, and so we can help out. We've got a lot of information, just kind of a quick overview of our office, uh, community development, workforce development, trade and export office. Uh, we have a lot of resources and data that you can check out. Um, other experts beyond, you know, myself, for instance, as a, as a regional labor market analyst, uh, we have workforce strategy consultants. Uh, we have business development managers, employer engagement specialists. We have small business assistance uh, centers and development centers, uh, the career force locations, of course. So there's just a, a lot of resources and experts, uh, whether you're a job seeker, career seeker, looking to uh, find that next job, transition into that next job, or um, kind of just move along into the labor market uh, with whatever challenges you might have. Or if you're an employer or business uh, that's looking to expand or relocate or find assistance uh, in, in other means, in other ways. So definitely check out uh, the DEED website. There's, there's just, it's almost overwhelming how much information we have and how many resources we have. Uh, so beyond helping you out with labor market information, which uh, can be a big takeaway here uh, for my presentation and that my position exists and uh, I aim to help out with this kind of stuff. It could be a quick question on, you know, what is the unemployment rate in Hennepin County? Uh, or what are the starting or median wages for different construction occupations, whether it's a uh, carpenter, electrician, a construction laborer, a heavy tractor trailer, a truck driver, anything and everything related to occupational industry statistics. So those quick questions, if you want an in-depth report on the construction industry sector, or if you want another presentation. Uh, so I can help out with that, but kind of going back to what I was saying before, I can also be a relay uh, if you're looking for other information uh, to other parts of DEED or even other departments within the state of Minnesota. So that's kind of the my quick introduction to the office. I did set a timer. I saw John, I've got maybe a few more minutes uh, that I can eat up, but uh, I did set a timer because things can get long-winded if you've seen me present before. Um, it, it's weird. I was a history major. I don't know why I look at statistics all day for nine years in a row. Um, I guess that's my life now, but uh, it's it's Good to have a timer. So we'll have some time for questions maybe at the end here. Uh, now I'm going to get off to the next. You can kind of see the outline of what I'll go, go over. Uh, it's kind of a teaser for just the information that we do have available. And I will apologize right now. Uh, I did to John and Salima and, you know, everybody that was helping me out with this presentation, uh, signing me up for it. Uh, I kind of put a ton of statistics in my slides. It's kind of for my benefit. Um, and for yours too, when you're looking at them later, but I apologize if it's just way too much information. Uh, also with that said, uh, I, I suppose we can get onto the next slide, but I always kind of give a guaranteed overview of what we're just seeing in the labor market. So that's kind of what this slide is looking at. And 
I apologize. I'm going to be looking down on my notes a little bit here. I've got like pages of chicken scratch. So it's just a ton of numbers. So get ready. Um, if we're looking at the most recent statistics, I don't know how many of you check out the monthly employer employment releases through the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Our labor market information office works in concert with the BLS. So the cool thing about that is, uh, you know, when you're looking at overall employment trends or unemployment statistics, um, whether it's for construction or the total of all industries or whatever it may be, the methodology that we use is the same that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses. So you can compare how we're doing in Minnesota to the United States. You can compare how we're doing to other states. And then you can also, the coolest thing, I suppose, is you can zoom down uh, to local regions, um, including the seven county metro, uh, the 16 county Minneapolis St. Paul metropolitan statistical area. Uh, the counties, and sometimes even with some of the data, you can get down to city level, zip code level, you name it. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll just give a brief overview on what we're seeing in the labor market, though. Um, if, if you did check out the August numbers, and kind of it's exciting because we just released Minnesota August numbers this morning at 10 o'clock. So I'll give you a quick overview of what we're seeing there. But at the national level, uh, uh, 235,000 jobs gained overall in August. So a little bit slower than we've seen overall so far in, in 2021 as the nation has averaged uh, 586,000 jobs gained uh, per month so far. Uh, employment is up by 17 million jobs, total jobs, since April of 2020, uh, but still down 5.3 million jobs from pre-pandemic levels. We're for zooming in on construction and then at the national level. Uh, construction was largely flat over the month of August, losing about 3,000 jobs, which is pretty pretty insignificant when you're considering the total size of construction at the national level. The industry is up 193,000 jobs over the year nationally. That's 2.7% growth. And then if we're just kind of looking at the long-term trends, this is the last national level data I'll give you. Uh, for construction, it did lose 1.1 um, million jobs uh, in the spring of 2020, uh, largely due to the impacts of COVID-19. It is still down about 232,000 jobs as of August 2021. Uh, so the construction industry sector has regained about 881,000 jobs since losing those 1.1 million due to COVID-19. So if I was to summarize the national level trends, um, we're seeing some very encouraging signs in 2021 when it comes to just overall employment growth. Uh, and overall construction growth is a little bit stronger than that overall employment growth. So now we'll, we'll zoom in on the state of Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota gained 4,300 jobs overall in the month of August. Uh, so we're continuing that, that monthly job expansion, uh, just like the national level through the summer months of 2021. Minnesota has gained an average of 16,600 jobs per month so far in 2021. So just like at the national level, a slightly weaker uh, August report than we've seen for past months uh, in 2021. Employment is up by 272,700 jobs uh, since April of 2020 in the state of Minnesota, but still down by about 143,600 jobs from pre-pandemic levels. So Minnesota did lose over 416,000 jobs uh, in the spring of 2020 due to the impacts of COVID-19. And we have regained about 65.5% uh, of those jobs lost back. So it's, it's encouraging, though, um, when you do look again, just like at the national level, the state level, we've had very encouraging uh, monthly reports so far in 2021. And if we zoom in now for the state of Minnesota on construction, and I should kind of put a tagline here, I'm grabbing all of this information I've relayed off to you so far uh, from the Current Employment Statistics, or CES tool. It's a monthly survey of businesses, firms throughout uh, the nation. Uh, and that's, yep, that's where we get those monthly employment numbers. You can get trends over time. You can even look up wage growth and also number of hours worked from this current employment statistics data. But when we're looking at construction in the state of Minnesota, uh, construction gained 600 jobs in the month of August, uh, up to now 127,900 total construction jobs in the state of Minnesota. We're looking over the year, uh, the construction industry sector gained 5,700 jobs from August of 2020 to August of 2021. That's a growth of 4.7%. And then finally, for construction in the state of Minnesota, just overall, 
when we're looking at the CES data, construction did lose uh, 10,400 jobs in the spring of 2020 due to the impacts of COVID-19, but is now actually 100 jobs as of August. You know, the 600 jobs gained in August, it doesn't sound like a lot of jobs, especially when you consider the total size of the 127,000 plus jobs in the construction industry sector. But that 600 job gain, that was enough to fully bring construction into fully 100% uh, recovery from the losses of COVID-19. So we actually have, as of August, 100 more jobs than we did pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so that's kind of a cool highlight for the construction industry sector. Overall in the state of Minnesota, we're seeing stronger construction employment growth in Minnesota than we are nationally. So the, the last thing I'll say about this slide here before we move on is uh, I, I wanted to, you kind of have to, when you're talking about labor market statistics, talk about labor force statistics really quickly. I'll just do this pretty briefly. Um, but labor force statistics, you know, that includes the unemployment rate, it includes the number of unemployed persons, it includes total employed persons, and then when you include the number of employed and unemployed, uh, that's where you get that total labor force size, uh, which is the black line represented in this graph here. So the main takeaways from this graph though, uh, I would say one, down to, well, 3.9% as of July, it's actually at 3.8% in August. I didn't get a chance to update this graph here, but we ticked down one tenth of a percentage point in August to 3.8% unemployment rate. Uh, and that represents about 115,000 unemployed Minnesotans uh, that are actively looking for work. That is down uh, from a very high peak of 11.3% at the height of the COVID-19 recession uh, in April of 2020, which represented about 350,000 unemployed Minnesotans. Um, and it is still slightly higher than the very low unemployment we saw, you know, between 3 and 3.2, 3.3%. Uh, before the COVID-19 hit, uh, which represented around 95,000 to 100,000 unemployed Minnesotans. So we're a little bit above pre-pandemic levels of unemployment uh, as of August of 2021, uh, but significantly down from the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. The one thing to remark though, another takeaway from this slide, probably the last one I'll say about it, is what are we measuring when we're talking about unemployment? And this is kind of getting to you know, if you're in the construction industry sector, if you're a firm, a business, and you're looking for workers and you're having trouble finding workers, uh, this is getting to that point of, yes, unemployment is low, uh, but what we're measuring is uh, significantly different than what we were measuring before COVID-19 hit. And, and a lot of that has to do with that labor force uh, size. So in the state of Minnesota, as of August of 2021, the total labor force size is down about 87,500 persons from before the pandemic hit. Uh, and so there's just a lot of folks in the state of Minnesota, and this mirrors what's happening at the national level too. It's a lot of folks that just aren't participating in the labor force. And this could be for a variety of reasons, uh, concerns over COVID-19 still, transportation issues, childcare issues, um, wanting to get back into the previous line of work and just waiting for that right moment, or looking for a new line of work. So looking to get in that new education or training experiences, the requirements for those new jobs. So there's just a whole host of reasons why folks might not be participating in the labor market as much as they were before COVID-19. Of course, a lot of questions come up when I bring this up about uh, the impact of uh, unemployment insurance um, benefits expiring, the extended benefits expiring at the beginning of this month here around Labor Day weekend. Uh, we still have yet to kind of get the data on that and see what kind of impact that has. Um, so reach out to the office, reach out to me if you want to look into that going forward. So that's kind of the overview. Uh, I apologize, I'm already like 20 or 10 minutes into this. Uh, so if we go to the next slide though, get rid of these overview on the labor market. Uh, this slide has way too much information on it. Uh, but I think it's it's for your benefit. This is now we're moving away from current employment statistics, that monthly survey of employment trends, and the labor force statistics I was showing you, that's from our local area unemployment statistics. That's also uh, based off of a monthly household survey. The data we are now looking at, and you can see it in the upper right, is the quarterly census of employment and wages. So this is, this is pretty powerful data. If, if you haven't checked it out before, uh, definitely check it out. Reach out to me if you need any help with it. 
Um, but this is data that every employer in the state of Minnesota is required to report uh, if they're under the unemployment insurance program. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a census of employment data. So we get number of establishments, we get total employment, total payroll, average weekly wages, uh, you get business um, uh, openings, closures, deaths, uh, births, all that kind of stuff. So you get business employment dynamics within this type of data as well. So not only that, but you can break it down and you see that in this uh, slide here by the major industry sectors. So those NAICS codes, the North American Industrial Classification System, we have 20 major industry sectors, construction, uh, and we're looking at the seven county metro area here. Construction is the metro area's 11th largest employing industry sector. And you can see that as of annual 2020, uh, there's about 6,800 construction establishments in the metro area supplying about 73,100 uh, 73, covered jobs. A total payroll of 5.8, almost $5.9 billion with an average annual wage of $80,080, which was, um, I wrote it in my notes here, about 12% higher than the average annual wage across all industries. Uh, another thing to note with the construction industry sector here with this QCW data, uh, construction wasn't hit as hard uh, when you're looking at uh, annual losses between 2019 and 2020. So you see 3.4% employment loss versus that 7.4% overall. Uh, that 3.4% is equivalent to about 2,600 construction jobs lost on an annual basis, 131,000, almost 900 for the total of all industries. I will remark though, and I got to look at my notes for this, that uh, if you're breaking it down, and this tool is called the quarterly census, so you can look at quarters one, two, three, or four. Uh, if you're looking at the specific quarterly trends, uh, things get a little bit more significant in terms of losses. So for instance, uh, for the construction industry sector, steepest losses were between the second quarters of 2019 and 2020, when it was a 5.7% loss of employment, equivalent to about 4,400 jobs. And then when you're moving to quarter three of, of 2019 to quarter three of 2020, again, this is the seven county metro, uh, it increased to a 6.5% loss of employment over that period of time, which was equivalent to about 5,400 construction jobs uh, lower in quarter three of 2020. Things did improve though, when you're looking at quarter four of 2019 to 2020. And so at that time, construction employment losses were 4.5%, uh, which was equivalent to about 3,300 jobs. So again, going from quarter two to quarter three to quarter four, if you're looking at those annual trends from 19 to 20, hopefully this is making sense. Uh, we went from 5.7% loss of employment up to 6.5% loss of employment, and then back down to 4.5% loss of employment. So the, the summary of all of this that I've said so far with this QCW data is that construction was hit uh, pretty significantly uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, this significance was at its highest during the second and third quarters, if you're looking at those annual trends, but we have seen improvement through the fourth quarter. Uh, we actually also have Q1 data out for 2021, and we've seen improvement through quarter one of 2021 as well. And so that's this, this data is basically backing up that uh, current employment statistics, that survey data that I was, that I was talking about before where when we're looking at construction as of August of 2021, full recovery of the, the jobs that we lost at the height of COVID-19. Uh, I should also remark that the current employment statistics data is benchmarked to this quarterly census of employment and wages data uh, annually. Um, and so that's one of the pros of this QCW data. The con is that it does take a little bit of time to collect uh, clean up and publish this data. So hopefully we'll have Q2 data coming out soon so we can just see how the construction industry sector continues to recover uh, into the summer months of 2021. If we go to the next slide, this is where we can start to uh, see more of the power of the QCW data tool. Um, you can start to really zoom in on those construction subsectors. So I highlighted the three major um, subsectors of construction. So you have construction of buildings, you have heavy and civil engineering construction, and then you have specialty trade contractors. Uh, and then each of those I actually broke down a little bit more uh, into even finer levels of industry subsectors. 
And you can actually even go a little bit more than what I've got on this slide here. You can get down to the six digit NAX code. So you can see here the finest level of detail I have for you is the four digit. But with this, you can see, you know, for instance, that specialty trade contractors has, as of annual 2020, about 46, almost 47,000 jobs in the seven county metro area. It was hit the hardest of the three major subsectors in construction over annual 2019 to 2020, losing 4.8% of its total employment. Uh, heavy and civil engineering construction uh, actually gained employment between annual 2019 and 2020. And if you're breaking it down, you can see that, that uh, those gains were most significant within uh, highway streets and bridge construction. And then you can also see construction of buildings, uh, the losses in there over the year entirely due to losses in the non-residential uh, building construction subsector. So at this slide, you can see again for those specific subsectors, the number of establishments, total employment in the seven county metro, total payroll and average annual wages. And once again, when we're looking at these average annual wages, and I'll kind of talk about this in later slides, but I'm stealing some thunder right now. With these higher average annual wages, um, it's one of those things that when we're looking at kind of the disconnects between job seekers and then workforce demand in the labor market today in the seven county metro area of the state of Minnesota, this is definitely one of the strengths of the construction industry sector to draw workers in. Uh, so hopefully that happens going forward even more so, uh, showing that these are excellent uh, occupations, excellent careers that are available, have excellent career ladders, um, and that you can get into these jobs relatively quickly when you're looking at, you know, not needing, for instance, for your degrees or higher for many of these jobs. Um, so looking at creative ways to get into the construction industry sector too, whether it's apprenticeships uh, or otherwise, and then looking at the wages and looking at the opportunities. So this is, this is a teaser of some of the ways that you can use uh, this QCW data beyond just looking at what are the historical trends uh, in our regions. Uh, I will say finally that uh, I didn't put it down in the slide here, but uh, the construction industry sector did grow by 23% in terms of total employment in the five years leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that was about three times faster than the 8% growth for the total of all industries in the five years leading up to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's, it's just really eye-opening to see how, uh, how fast construction was growing in the metro area leading up to COVID-19. It was hit like all industries during COVID-19, but then the main takeaway that we saw before, it's, it's recovered much faster uh, than the total of all industries. So we can continue on. So this is just a, another look at a kind of teased unemployment insurance statistics. It's, it's been a wild year for unemployment insurance. Uh, that's another division within the Department of Employment and Economic Development. They've been extremely busy. Um, and this is a, kind of a slide showing why that might be. And this is, a, this, as we were talking about before, construction wasn't hit as hard as many other industries, including the combination of food, retail trade, other services. Um, but you can still see with COVID-19 where unemployment insurance claims, both initial and continued uh, regular claims, uh, spiked during March and April of 2020. And then we see that seasonal increase in the winter months of 2020, compounded by increased COVID cases during the, during the winter months of 2020. So we also see though that through July of 2021, that uh, initial UI claims and continued uh, and PUA continued claims uh, for unemployment insurance did decrease, have decreased uh, significantly from their heights, uh, not only in 2020, but also from uh, the winter months of 2020. So if I was looking at my notes here, uh, I should remark that as of July of 2021, uh, initial claims are still about 27% higher than they were in July of 2019, pre-pandemic. And then regular and PUA continued UI claims uh, were still about 200% higher than such claims were in July of 2019. So we're not out of the woods yet. You know, I've talked about how construction has has been stronger in the state of Minnesota than it has nationally. I've talked about how construction has recovered faster in the state of Minnesota than the total of all industries. Uh, but this slide is really showing that, uh, yeah, we're not, we're not out of the woods yet. There's still a lot of folks that are, that are looking for help, looking for benefits 
uh, within the construction industry sector even. So we'll continue to keep an eye on these claims, uh, especially now that those extended claims have expired as of Labor Day weekend. So going forward, I think I've got like 10 minutes left. Um, other interesting data that you can look into, and this is kind of related to a lot of the information that I've seen uh, many of you present on today. So this is kind of interesting where you can kind of get a benchmark for the construction industry sector overall. And now we're looking at uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul Metropolitan Statistical Area. And I should remark, this is only the Minnesota part uh, of the Minneapolis-St. Paul MSA. Interesting enough, there's actually two counties uh, within the Minneapolis-St. Paul MSA, that 16 county region that are in the state of Wisconsin, St. Uh, Croix and Pierce counties. And a lot of those have to do with, you know, those MSAs commuting patterns. So we're looking at people that are commuting in, commuting out, and that's basically what labor market areas are all about. You know, where are workers living? Where are they working? So now we're looking at this 14 county Minneapolis St. Paul MSA. This slide is looking at uh, the most recent data from the quarterly workforce indicators or QWI tool. And this is from the local employer household dynamics, LEHD data. Uh, there's a couple of other really neat data tools that they have. It's a part of the, um, uh, the Census Bureau. And so this data is actually combining quarterly census of employment and wages data that uh, all the states collect and hand off to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and then it's combined with census data. So we can kind of look at employment by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by educational attainment, uh, all of that stuff. And it's just, it's really overwhelming, really cool, powerful data. So I definitely highly recommend checking out the QWI Explorer data tool um, when you've got a slow day at work or something like that. So this is looking at overall, you can see that uh, it's probably no surprise for all of those that are in construction here, or just you, you guys talk about construction a lot, um, but you can see that construction does have overall a lower share of workers that are younger. In this case, the QWI tool does go down to 14, um, but between 14 and 24, and it does have a lower share of workers uh, that are above uh, 55. So the highest share of workers in construction, 71.4% overall, are between the ages of 25 and 54. And that is compared to uh, 64, where did I put that? 64.9% for the total of all workers in the Minneapolis MSA being between 25 and 54. So there's about a six percentage point difference in just that kind of prime working age group being within construction versus every other industry sector. I should also remark though that there's still about 19%, so one in five workers in the construction industry sector overall that are 55 years of age and older. So just something to keep in mind. If you go on to the next slide, we're moving on from those age statistics then to gender statistics. So share of uh, males and share of females in, I put at the very top, the total of all industries for kind of a base look. So about half and half, which makes sense. And then looking at the construction industry sector along with those more in-depth construction subsectors. So I, I should have bolded these, uh, but yeah, construction of buildings, heavy and civil engineering construction, and then specialty trade contractors. I would probably bold those ones in that list on the left there uh, for being those, those more major subsectors. And then there's just a couple of other more in-depth industries within this chart. Uh, but it's pretty eye-opening to see um, just the share of workers that are, that are male versus female, looking at, again, the total of all construction workers in these different industry sectors. I should remark, I think I put it down here. Yep. I've got some cool notes for trends though. Uh, overall female employment in construction is up uh, about 70% since 2010. And that's compared to about 53% uh, for male construction workers. And of course that makes sense when you've got a smaller share of workers that are actually female construction workers, but it's still encouraging to see uh, that increase is higher for female construction workers. Uh, that's since 2010. And then looking more recently, since 2015, uh, the share of female construction workers has increased by about 26% in the Minneapolis MSA, and that's compared to about 11% for male construction workers. So encouraging to see those trends um, when, when we're looking at diversifying the construction industry sector. If we go to the next slide then, 
Finally, we're looking at uh, one more aspect of the, the quarterly workforce indicators data tool. Uh, you can break down total employment then by race and ethnicity. So you can see here when we're looking at the overall look of construction, uh, about 93.3% of the total construction workers in the Minneapolis St. Paul MSA uh, are white construction workers. And then you can see about 2.6% are black or African American construction workers. And then you can see, for instance, that 5.1% are reporting as Hispanic or Latino. And that does uh, go past 100% as when we're looking at this data, those reporting as Hispanic or Latino uh, can also report as being of any other race. So white, black or African American, Asian or other Pacific Islander, two or more races, or American Indian and Alaska Native. Like the, when we're looking at gender, I've got a couple of uh, fast facts here that are pretty cool. Um, for instance, when we're looking at those share of construction workers reporting as black or African American within the Minneapolis MSA, uh, that has increased by 173% uh, since 2010. And that's compared to 51% for white construction workers. So again, just like when we're looking at uh, male versus female, it is a smaller share, of course, and that's going to result in, in those pretty stark differences in percentage increases over time. But it's still encouraging to see those really you know, big percentage increases, the diversification of the construction industry sector um, when we're looking at this over time. Since 2015, the share of Black or African American construction workers has increased by 17%, and that's, that's compared to 12% for white construction workers. Uh, I'll give one more example here, uh, two more examples. When we're looking at Asian or other Pacific Islander construction workers, it's increased by 185%, uh, those share of workers since 2010, and it's increased by 57% since 2015. And again, that's compared to 12% for white construction workers. And then in my last example, when we're looking at those reporting as Hispanic or Latino, uh, since 2010, the share of those construction workers in the Minneapolis MSA has increased by 211 percent and since 2015 it's uh, that share of workers in, has increased by 43 percent so this slide is showing uh, that snapshot in time um, i should have remarked on this before all the data that we've seen in these past three slides on age on gender and on race and ethnicity is from the average of quarters one two and three uh, for the year 2020 uh, so a snapshot in time but then when we're looking at those trends over time between 2010 and 2020 and 2015 and 2020, uh, it's, it's pretty encouraging and pretty eye-opening to see uh, how the share of female construction workers, the share of uh, persons of color and indig indigenous populations in construction has increased significantly over those periods of time. Uh, also, I don't have it within these slides. Reach out to me if you want these stats, though. But you can also, with this QWI tool, look at earnings. You can look at turnover. You can look at hires and separations. So it's just, it's a really powerful tool. We have a similar tool within our department uh, called Quarterly Employment Demographics, uh, where we actually combine our QCW industry data with uh, data from the Department of Public Safety from driver's licenses. Uh, with that tool, we can only, though, uh, look at age and also gender, but still pretty similar data. So reach out to me if you want some of that. Uh, one more fast fact. If we went back to slide for, for gender, I just wanted to remark one more thing. Um, fast fact, in 1995, uh, the female share of construction workers was 12.5% in the Minneapolis MSA. That increased to, it kind of stayed the same, 12.6% female construction workers in 2000, increased to 13.6% in 2005, increased to 14.3% in 2010. It actually dipped a little bit to 14% through 2015, and then it increased again uh, to 15.6% in 2020. So it's, you, can, you can go back in time pretty, pretty far through at least about 1995. So now we can move on. Uh, my timer has two minutes. Uh, with our JVS data, um, this is a, a pretty cool tool that we have uh, where we're, we're surveying um, employers throughout the state of Minnesota, about 10,000 every second and fourth quarter. And we're not only getting the hiring demand, but the characteristics of that hiring demand. 
We are currently only through the fourth quarter of 2020, but we should have the second quarter of 2021 coming out uh, within the next couple of weeks. So get excited for that. Reach out to me uh, for you know learning more about that data when it comes out. Oh, cool. Thanks, Selena. Uh, but yes, you can definitely see uh, how COVID-19 has impacted hiring across the construction industry sector. This is for the state of Minnesota. Uh, but you can see that it actually held pretty steady uh, through the second quarter of 2020. So uh, that's pretty interesting. It only dropped by about 6% through that time uh, from the second quarter of 2019. So hiring remained pretty high, pretty strong, uh, despite the impacts of COVID-19 in the summer months of 2020. It did dip by about 47%, though, between the fourth quarters of 2019 and the fourth quarter uh, of 2020. So it'll be really interesting and eye-opening to see uh, how that might rebound through the second quarter of 2021, especially as if you've checked out presentations or articles from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, uh, one of their big takeaways is that hiring demand remains strong uh, through the construction industry sector through the summer months of 2021. So I would anticipate hiring demand, the number of vacancies to climb right back up with the release of Q2 data. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, where's that timer? So just the, the couple of slides that I've got here are just looking at a teaser of some of those construction um, vacancy characteristics. Uh, so just some of the takeaways are that, um, you know, for quarter four, quarter two, generally construction vacancies, um, a much higher share of full-time work. Uh, there is a higher share of work that does require um, related work experience, one year's plus experience. Uh, than across any other industry sector. Um, this makes sense uh, when we're looking at the, the jobs within construction and the tasks and responsibilities and duties are required of these types of occupations. Slightly higher share of required certificates or licensees. Many times this might be driver's licensees or OSHA or hazmat or things like that uh, that are required in different types of construction occupations. Uh, a big takeaway though is also that the median wage offers uh, for instance, you see here, quarter four of 2020, $24, just, just over $24 for that median wage offer, quite a bit higher than one year previous, the quarter four of 2019. Um, so that might have to do with, we're looking for workers, sometimes we can't find them. So wages, uh, we have seen wages climb uh, pretty significantly across all industries, including construction, since 2019 especially, and also um, uh, since 2018, especially, and also since 2019. Um, oh, yes. So with that, I had a fast fact here for you. Uh, the median wage offer uh, for construction is, as of quarter four of 2020, 45% higher than the median wage offer across all industries at 1659. Uh, the other interesting thing here that I didn't put in here is uh, our department has a cost of living calculator. It's not poverty living, it's not middle class living, it's a, it's a cost of living for a basic needs budget for health and safety. And so you can break that cost of living down for individuals, for family sizes, all that kind of stuff, different geographies. And uh, a takeaway here is that these, these median wage offers, and of course the median wages overall uh, for construction, definitely meet and exceed those, those cost of living uh, within the state of Minnesota, within the metro area. So you can go to the next slide. That's the Q2 data. So check that out later. And then you can also go to the next slide. And this is, uh, this is basically kind of the same information from, uh, from Talent Neuron. If you're, uh, if you're familiar with that tool, it's got cool stuff. It's, it's basically uh, taking information from a variety of hiring sites and job posting sites, aggregating it up and and putting it into a pretty cool data tool. So I can grab some of that information sometimes. Real-time talent uh, is, a, is a great organization that you can reach out to for this type of information as well. Uh, but you can see in the Minneapolis St. Paul MSA, approximately 1,300 job postings in construction uh, over the past two months here. And you can see the breakdown by occupation. You can see the breakdown by skills uh, that uh, construction firms are looking for, top certifications, um, and so definitely reach out to me or those folks at Real-Time Talents if, if you're interested in more of this, this type of data. 
And with that, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, the, the, the last remaining slides that I have for you today uh, are actually, I grabbed them from, and I would highly encourage you to check these out, uh, from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. Um, you can see that some of those things are actually missing. Saw that before I did this presentation. So some of the other concerns that or obstacles that employers or job seekers are running into beyond concerns over COVID-19, lack of opportunities in career fields, teleworking options and qualifications are also lower paid available jobs, level of education and training and lack of transportation. So some of those are gonna be challenges I, I would suppose and you might run into these too if you're a construction firm looking to hire folks. You know, when you're looking at transportation or if you're looking at lack of teleworking options, uh, if childcare comes into the mix for workers looking for work. Um, but some of these other ones, uh, for instance, uh, available jobs and then also pay, as we've seen before, these are those things that construction can really tout as uh, this is an excellent industry sector. We're a growing industry sector. There's a lot of opportunities, whether it's with the Southwest light rail line or other areas of construction in the Twin Cities metro area. Uh, that are available for workers if they're looking to get back into the labor market. The next slide kind of looks at those same things for factors that that uh, job seekers are looking for. Uh, so you can take a look at those if you're a construction hiring firm, um, HR, things like that. Uh, this isn't super related to what's going on in construction, but just a couple of other takeaways on just what the labor market, how it's doing uh, with COVID-19, how it continues to do in the summer months and as we enter the fall months of 2021. And then the last slide I've got from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. This is also kind of, a, I suppose, a, a good thing for construction. You can see that a lot of job seekers are looking for full-time work. And as we saw before with those vacancies, a higher share of construction vacancies are actually for full-time work. The challenge might be the temporary seasonality of such job postings, of course. Um, but this is another thing that uh, construction firms can tout as, hey, check us out. We've got excellent opportunities. So with that, I'll end on, well, two more things. Uh, one is I just actually saw a presentation from Ron Wirtz at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. If you didn't check that out, you can check it out at their website. I think they'll have it posted soon. But some of the takeaways, and I'm sure you guys are running into this too, the three big things that uh, he got from the survey of construction firms across the ninth district was that uh, they're running into delays, persistent delays, um, and they have seen that those delays are starting to continue to be more of a problem as we continue through 2021. Interestingly enough, though, project cancellations aren't becoming quite significant yet, so that's a good thing. Another thing, labor constraints and labor availability. Uh, just we've reverted quickly back to a tight labor market within the state of Minnesota in the seven county metro area. So labor availability is definitely another huge thing that construction firms are dealing with. And then finally, you've probably had these conversations too, or at least talked about them uh, in, your own, in your own time, but supply chain disruptions and then the high cost for materials, uh, which can result in higher wages, uh, well, wages also rising, but can also kind of dampen the demand for labor for construction projects going forward. Uh, the interesting thing though, so definitely check these out. Uh, Ron Wirtz is definitely more of a, an expert on talking about these surveys that they've done, but uh, the last takeaway that I've mainly got from them, despite these challenges uh, in the labor market, construction firms still largely optimistic for the six month outlook. Uh, so that's a good thing when we're, when we're looking at construction and they're still hiring, hiring activity is, is still going up. Uh, so that's a good thing. So there's a lot of different resources that you can check out either through our department, Minneapolis Fed Reserve, uh, when you're looking into construction, real time talent, when you're looking into construction, statistics and just how is it doing in in the labor market today do i have more slides oh and then the finally the last thing uh i apologize for it got long-winded i said i wouldn't do that um but if you go to the next slide uh if you're in construction if you're in hr or if you're just looking to talk to students or job seekers or just anybody that you think might be interested in construction uh or if you're looking at your own jobs within your own company um, you can look at our Occupational Employment and Wage Statistics, our OEWS tool um, online. And it's a survey that we do of employers across the state of Minnesota getting estimated employment for over 800 occupations along with that specific wage data. So hourly wages. So 
We're getting 10th, 25th, 50th, that median wage, 75th and 90th percentile wages. And I just put a couple of exam uh, examples here for construction occupations. Uh, with the final line there on the right, seven county metro area, 10 year employment projections. We will be updating those projections very soon. Um, so stay tuned for that. I think that is everything. The last slide there is just uh, some contact information, not only for me, but reach out to the rest of the office if you have any questions um, or the, just check out the Main Deed website for all the other resources, like I mentioned before, the business development managers, workforce strategy consultants, employer engagement specialists, small business development centers, uh, so on and so forth. So with that, um, I'll conclude. And if there's any questions, I can I suppose take questions at first time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was fantastic. And there was a request in the chat that uh, there's a lot of interest in the data involving the growth of women and people of color, BIPOC communities from the different years that you said and the, the rise of them vis-a-vis -vis counterparts. And so if that those uh, slides ever become, a, a, if you're ever able to get your hands on those slides, we would love to be able to share them as handouts with our team. Sure and thing. we just wanted to remind everybody that the slides that Tim, that was were presented today are already in the PowerPoint slides that were emailed to everybody. So you already have these slides with you, but if anybody cannot locate them, just let us know and we'll send it to you again. Perfect. But are you okay with taking some questions? Yep. And, you know, if there's any, before we get to maybe any possible questions uh, with that, you know, you're talking about uh, the QWI data, you're looking at, you know, women in construction or looking at populations of color. Uh, that could be an idea. I, I do these monthly blogs. I don't know how many people check them out. It's like four people, I think. But uh, reach out to me if you have any ideas that you want me to look into. That could be a possible idea for me, look, you know, going forward, looking at construction, uh, you know, employment trends by demographics. So maybe I'll just do that. I do have manufacturing month coming up. So that one's covered and then veterans uh, month for November, but possibly December, I'll look into this. But if you want that data more, you know, if you want it sooner, I can help you out with a, a customized report. Thank you, Tim. That's wonderful. We want to open it up to our advisory for questions. Hi, Tim. John O'Feelan calling, uh, talking. Um, I got a, a question. I actually had it for Ron Wirtz, too. I sat in on that meeting, and uh, he he actually wanted me to follow up with him. So uh, this is really great news about the QWES data, and I, I definitely would like to see that. Um, what I find interesting is the Associated, uh, the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota does a industry assessment every year. Um, I just looked at 180 people, uh, contractors submitted their, their survey. I've monitored that for 10 years and the themes that I get out of it is uh, contractors can't find workers. And then you go to one area and the survey was redone uh, about three, four years ago to add the JATCs and community-based training organizations, like where do you find your labor? And 35% of them don't even use the JATCs. 65% don't use community-based organizations and 60, 69% don't use technical colleges. I, I, I just switched that around. Uh, and then, so I, I find it interesting because the supply pool is, I, I think um, uh, it doesn't turn up in our data. I think there's more of a supply side than we realize. Um, I'm not saying that we can fill every position, but it's interesting to see where contractors go to find workers and where workers are being trained. And there's an, an there's a dichotomy there that has not been yet mended. And um, so I just want to point it out because I think it's a data flaw. And I think it's worth us addressing when you have 180 contractors telling you that they're not going to community-based organizations, technical colleges, or even 30%, not even using their own union hall, which they actually pay the union hall, the union contractors, to train those workers. So, um, they, they, they're part of a training committee, a curriculum committee, everything. So they, they're the ones who, uh, you know, they come out of the, right out of the employer's paycheck as well as the employees. So just want to make a comment, um, something that I think we should always note. And then hopefully one day we can get to the point where we understand what that supply side better. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, John. 
Mary Schmidt has her uh, hand up. Hey, thanks, Tim. Nice for you to join us today. I was wondering, and maybe if I follow up with you, you can give more insight on this, but I'd be curious about the size of the construction contractors, the 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 employers who were both laying off in our industry over the last two years, and then those that were hiring again. Um, I'd be especially curious to see sort of the size of those establishments, you know, were they the larger ones or were they smaller ones? Because, you know, just sort of in general, a lot of small businesses were really hurt significantly during COVID. So it'd be interesting to see when it came to the layoffs and the rehiring where that was happening. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you might have some insight on that if I follow up with you, yeah. Yeah, I'll see if I can uh, grab some information about that. We actually, um, uh, one of our analysts, uh, Mustafa Hamida, actually just wrote a pretty large article on the impacts of COVID on different sized firms and establishments. Um, and seeing that overall, um, it actually, it was like mid-sized firms and establishments that were hit the hardest. Those between, I believe it was 10 and 49 employees. And of course, when you're thinking overall, that's like the size of most restaurants. Um, so, but I'll, I'll reach out to him and see if he actually broke that information down by um, industry sector. So we could see like, for instance, construction. I think that would almost exactly go at your question there. Uh, but yeah, you can check out, um, I think that article is available uh, online now. I'll look into that, but I'll get back to you. Yeah, because, you know, our industry in, in Minnesota construction, it's just, you know, what is it, like 14,000 of our firms have less than 10 employees and just a few dozen have, or I can't remember what the numbers are, or John O'Fallon maybe remembers, but we have just a few who have, um, say, you know, greater than 500. And so, um, yeah, it would just be interesting to see how, how that employment uh, uh, numbers changed across the size of the business. And yeah, then definitely. I have one other question. I'm just curious. Um, in the, in the, uh, the job numbers, when we think about like MnDOT, you know, we're nearly 5,000 employees. We have many, many, you know, thousands of them that work in maintenance and construction. Are they actually classified in government or are they broken down? Um, and so they would also be showing up under construction, under highway heavy, something like that when it comes to employment. Um, I believe those workers would be within government. I will look into that though. That's a good question. Tim, this is Gilbert. I have a quick question. Do you want us to reach out to you directly or how would you share some of this um, data? So we're very interested in some of these um, data that's been asked. Yeah, I think Salima was saying that you know these slides are part of the, the current slide deck. So you've got access to that. And then, um, yeah, you can reach out to me anytime. Uh, uh, I'll, put my, I'll put my email in the chat here. So Thank you. you. Shoot me an email anytime. Yeah. And Gilbert, the agenda that we sent out today, uh, John included the the a PDF of all the slides for today. Okay, so the ones well, you saw today that you have. Right, right. And as soon as you get us the new ones, our our meetings are held on the third Thursday of the month. So whenever you have an opportunity, we can include it as a handout. Thank you, Salima. It, it was more in relation to the the added you know request, but thank you. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. I'll put my uh I'll put my email in there. Can... All right. I appreciate it then. Yeah, thank you. How do we get a hold of your blog? Where where is that? Uh I'll put a link in the chat there too. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like my mom and dad check it out, my boss. <laughs> About it. That's wonderful. A any other questions? If you have your hand raised, I may not be able to see you because I can only see part of the group so anyone else with any questions well thank you so much tim this was fantastic we really appreciated the data and we hope that this is one of many times that you come back 
on a, on a regular basis and tell us what's going on in terms of the data of the workforce. We deeply appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me out and giving me the time. Thanks. I'll I'll stick around here. I'll put my uh, email in and then going forward, just reach out to me anytime you want some labor market information. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, Ashanti, back to you. Thank you, Salima. All right. Um, we've reached the point in time where uh, we invite uh, those who pre-registered uh, to provide public comment to provide that. Did uh, anyone, do we have anyone that registered? Um, John or maybe Jason knows? No, no, nobody uh, requested to speak, so. All right, well, just as, as a reminder um, for those who may be listening uh, through YouTube or on the uh, Met Council website, um, if you do wish to offer public comment at a future future virtual meeting, whether it be this advisory committee meeting or other, please pre-register by emailing uh, that uh, uh, address on the screen. Um, you may also send us your comments by email as well, and uh, we will address them appropriately appropriately. Um, with that, Ashanti? Uh, yes, go ahead. This is Barb Lau. I am just wondering if we could add something to the agenda because um, I know it's late today and I want you guys to have some preparation, etc. But I just um, wonder if next month we could talk about what the status is with the um, extended schedule, the price escalation that we're seeing on um, commodities and supply delays um, and what the resolutions have been on this trickling down to DBEs. I know we talked about it um, when we first had the schedule, um, when the schedule increased. And I was just wondering if we could have an update on where we're at with all of that at the next meeting. And I just, um, and particularly I was just reading an article today about how Hurricane Ida has already like had a drop in manufacturing, which could mean even more delays or price escalation for these small businesses that are struggling so much right now. Would that be possible to get on the agenda next month? Um, thank you, Barb. Um, and that um, also serves as a reminder. Well, first, let me say, um, yes, um, that is possible to give, uh, get that on the agenda. Um, I, I, I really don't know exactly sure what we have already committed to the agenda, but I'm sure we could fit that in um, uh, to our agenda for next month. I think, of course, it is an important topic um, that um, uh, is definitely impacting uh, all contractors, especially subcontractors on the project, but uh, also has a tendency to uh, impact uh, DBE and, and small certified small businesses um, at a at a more greater uh, a greater level. So uh, yes, it is an important topic. We will add it, and then um, your question also serves as a reminder that we are always um, seeking input from uh, this advisory committee um, for ideas and topics for um, our upcoming agendas. So if you have um, ideas, things you want to hear about, things you want to hear about from the council, um, from MDHR, from the contractors, uh, industry related topics, please um, send those to either Salima or myself, and we will do our best to bring the appropriate people, uh, make the appropriate contacts, um, and uh, uh, get that on our, our agendas moving forward. So I'm um, always um, uh, looking for your feedback and input on uh, what you want to hear and what you want to uh, receive information on. Are there any other uh, questions uh, from committee members uh, before we go? 
Um, I, I think that before we have our meeting next month, there is going to be a um, a week of diversity or something like that that's being promoted. Um, I, Salima, do you recall what the actual yeah, title of it was? Like a construction Inclusion Week or something like that. Yeah, that we um, we saw an article in the Star Tribune and in Finance and Commerce about this nationwide um, uh, effort to dedicate a week where the focus is on inclusion in the construction industry. And uh, John, maybe we can share that article out with everybody, because I believe that Krista is attending some events that are designed on that week. Sure, I'll, I'll send the website all right now. Oh, that's great. Thank you, John. Yeah, it would be interesting to know um, what contractors in our state, in our region, in our industry are, are participating and supporting that uh, event as well. So that's also a, uh, a topic we can kind of uh, consider uh, hearing about, hearing some more about. But thank you, John, for sharing that. I'm really interested, this is Monica, in learning more around the DEI space uh, when it comes to construction. So I'm new to the construction industry. Um, so I'll be learning from a lot of you folks. I came from Best Buy. I was there for 16 years and we've done a lot in this space. And so I'm really excited to see um, what's happening in the industry and then also be a part of the story and helping grow uh, the DEI work in construction. So. If anyone knows of any events that are happening uh, locally or how we can get involved or how I can get involved and uh, would love to connect with whomever in the group to to get started. So thank you. And thank you, Monica. Welcome. And I'm sure that uh, you'll probably receive a lot of comments in the chat and uh, communication um, from this group. Uh, this is a, a really good group knowledgeable, active, and um, willing to uh, share that information. So I'm sure uh, folks will follow up with you. Can somebody refresh my memory? Uh, who's, who's Monica with again? I am the new HR director over at LS Black. So I'm new to the organization. I started on um, March 31st. And so I work with uh, Brian Leach over at Franklin. Um, so yeah, again, new to construction, new to the industry, came 16 years out of retail in the HR space and um, I'm excited to be here, so. And I'll take all of the, all of the chat advice or emails uh, you guys have for me. So thank you all. Monica, this is Barb Lau. It looks like you're on the roster to attend our event Saturday. So it, it's a crowded room, but have someone, in, have Emily introduce you to me. Um, and then we can meet face to face. Yeah, um, I'll be there with Emily and Vicki. Uh, so it'll be an exciting event. We're all excited to join. You're already member. All right, um, any other questions, comments? Excellent, it is a beautiful day out. So um, I wanna thank you all again for your participation in today's meeting and in all our meetings and moving forward. Um, our next meeting will be held on Thursday, October 21st. And as always, please stay connected by our construction updates, social media, and through our project website. Um, also, you can also connect with me um, or any of our project staff um, here at the, the council and uh, uh, within our light rail unit specifically. Um, with that, um, I will adjourn uh, this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Great meeting. And thank you, Tim. Thank you.